Hi, this is Lou Ann Worley with Rock and Book Reviews, and I'm so happy to be here today with Steve Calcum. Uh, Steve and I have had a history of trying to get together here, but we finally made it. Um, Steve, you were raised in Colorado and went to the university there. You received degrees in agricultural and in range management. What does a range management degree consist of? Um, well, range management is the study, care, and management of natural grazing lands. My job with the uh, BLM was to go out and monitor the allotments as much as I was able and determine what impacts, if any, the grazing livestock were having and what could be done to alleviate the problems. And a lot of it is... Um, unfortunately, kind of politicking, trying to talk the ranchers into doing what is best for them, but they don't want to do because, and I can't blame them, they're concerned about their bottom line. And if you say, well, you've got to take 10% of your animals off, they're looking at, I can't survive on 90%. And at times it gets to the point of, well, you can get by on 90% or you can get by on 0%. We tried to never, ever do that in the BLM because so many of the ranchers have connections with the state senators, with it, a lot of trying to talk people into doing what's best for the environment and manipulate them into seeing that, well, if I put on five cows, I get 50 pounds per cow, so that's 250 pounds of meat. And the cow is going to consume X amount of foliage, whether it gains meat or not. But if you can put on four cows and get 70 pounds of meat per cow, you're only feeding four cows and you're actually making more meat. And so worth it to you to reduce your stocking rate so you get more per animal that's going to reduce the amount of damage because we only have four animals tracking up the ground instead of five now granted all the allotments had a lot more than four or five cows i had one that the the allotment was 98 percent private land there was like three acres of badlands where the ground goes fair ground straight up and down there's nothing there that was federal everything else was private but it was still counted as an allotment i had to monitor it so you were forced into retirement due to health issues uh what type of health issues did you encounter and what difficulties do you experience because of these um I had a history of Meniere's disease. And what is that? And uh, Meniere's disease is a dysfunction in the inner ear where the balance tubes are. So you'd swear you're on a ship in the middle of the ocean, in the middle of a class five hurricane when you're walking through your living room or falling through your living room. I had a seizure that was caused, they think, by dehydration and low potassium, and since been just classified as a non-organic seizure, meaning there's nothing physically wrong, but the seizure definitely took place. And what that did was it took the Meniere's disease and made it more or less permanent. I have a very restricted driver's license, and for a while I had no license at all. They, the BLM, tried from 2011 to 2014 to get me reassigned successfully to somewhere else. The problem with the BLM is that if you're not at the state office or DC, you're in a field office and everyone in the field office is expected to be able to go out to the field. And when you can't drive above 35, 40 miles an hour, um, they just aren't real enthused about having you on staff. That had to be difficult. It was very frustrating that, come on, I'll take, give, just give me the J-O-B. I'll do the 
do whatever I can. Maybe a, a GIS specialist or something. But now, uh, since I haven't used it in so long, I don't think I could do anything with GIS. Okay, so, and that's one reason you have your little sidekick there is because you're um, at home dad. <laughs> I, I am an at-home dad. Um, she's almost two, and we have uh, Beatrice, who's just over six months. Oh, wow. And that's going to be it. So I'll take my two, and if I get to where I can't stand not having another kid, I'll talk to her about adoption. <laughs> Which is a great thing. Um, a lot of people don't want children these days. <laughs> okay, so you have had to do a lot of extensive writing with your reports in your previous job, correct? Yes. And with all your writing experience, you developed skills and strengthened your writing ability. What was the deciding factor that encouraged you to become a writer? Well, that actually goes back uh, quite some time, um, a period in 1997 when I was without a job and I couldn't get a job. We were in a small town, Yuma, Colorado, and no one wanted to hire me because I had these college degrees. And I said, why won't you hire me? I, I'm here to do the work. Well, if you get a chance, you're going to leave. I still got to eat in the meantime, but they didn't didn't really see it that way. And so kind of out of desperation, I, I started a story and then that computer crashed real hard and burned nothing salvageable. And I kind of let it go for a while. And then I got a job where I had a, a very, very good man as a boss. And even if I wasn't doing work, I could just put down office and he would keep me on that way. And so during those times where I'm waiting for tests to proceed, waiting for a call to or whatever, I would write. Between 1998 and 2006, I wrote and rewrote and then transcribed onto computer and rewrote again uh, the book Freeborn. I did send a cop who's a professor at Arizona State University, and he had a lot of really, really good things to say. Well, I was impressed with it. It was, uh, I thought it was very good reading. Um, your book, Freeborn, tell us a little bit about the story. What inspired it? I don't know exactly what I could point to and say this is the inspiration. Part of it, I guess, was I wanted to write a fantasy version of a uh, Louis L'Amour Western where you've got the strong man who finds himself in unpleasant, difficult, perilous situations because he's trying to do the right thing not the popular thing not the easy thing um but to do the right thing i made him mixed race human and and uh copper elf the brief stint that he has in school and during a lot of his travels times that he stays somewhere he is the object of a lot of prejudice because the races just don't mix. Even the elven races or sub races don't mix together because one is seen as, well, they see themselves as nobles and the others they see are seen by those same elves as gutter spawn. So Freeborn's scholastic experience has it comes to a rather dramatic and bloody conclusion and then he's stuck with a blood price that is like five or six lifetimes worth of hard labor. Unbeknownst to him, his his adoptive father has a mine that has gold, silver, and later they find uh, mithril in the mine. It's a walk-in treasury. So he spends, now he spends winter and part of spring there. And when he and his uh, dwarven companion leave, Freeborn's carrying more money than probably half the nobles in any given town have in their entire fortune. So he goes to pay the blood debt, and of course the families that he offended are not real 
interested in collecting the blood debt. They weren't interested in collecting his blood. So he basically winds up running, hiding, and fighting his way to Central Fair, where the court is, finds out that the uh, summons had been altered to change the date, so that even if he showed up on time, he was too late. I found that it had a lot of interesting characters you created, and it had action and nonstop adventure, and it was a book that you just couldn't put down because you had to see what was coming next. I thought it was very good. Is there going to be a second book? Yes, and a third. Okay. I have a very rough draft of a second book. My goal was to write a book that I want to read. So your next big project is finishing the next two books? Yeah, I'm going to rewrite the second book and then perhaps the third book. I've also given some thought to giving Freeborn a break and working on some of the writing that I have on my uh, author's page. I have pages titled Shattered Empire Scribe. On those, I have pieces of my writing, including a uh, short story called The The Blizzard Birth, which is now the prologue to Freeborn. Well, I particularly would like to have you finish the second one so I can read it. (laughs) See what happens next? Yes, I've been waiting a long time now. (laughs) <laughs> okay, you have a giveaway to give, right? Oh, yes. I will uh, give away to one lucky person a copy of the latest and greatest version of Freeborn, the uh, Folio Avenue version. And I love it. And um, I will autograph it and personalize the uh, autograph to the winner's name. We will have a raffle copter on rockandbookreviews.com that will randomly pick out a winner. Have you got final comments you'd like to make before we close? I hope that all your audience decides that they'd like to read the book and as many as are willing leave a positive book review. And I understand Amazon has to have 35 reviews before they'll even promote your book. So we encourage everyone to please send reviews. And it's been a pleasure. And your daughter is just beautiful. She's just really sweet. And I commend you for being an at-home dad, that they are needed. And this is exactly why I have a hard time writing. (laughs) <laughs> I can understand. She, says, oh, she wants on daddy's hat lap and then she wants to help. <laughs> what pretty soon she'll be the star of the show. <laughs> and we hope that all of you out there will search the universe through books. Goodbye now.